Bark beetles affect uh, needle leaf forests across the world. In fact, many bark beetles affect broadleaf species as well. But it, it, uh, this seems like a good place to talk about bark beetles, particularly in the West, because the Western United States are such dry ecosystems, dry forests. Now, um, all, all of the pines that we, all the needle leaf species that we would find in Western forests have their bark beetles. Uh, our scale leaf uh, trees also, such as uh, cedars, junipers, giant sequoia, they have their bark beetles as well, but they're not, oftentimes they're, they're not as important. Bark beetles are, are very important biological agents of tree mortality in western needle leaf forests, so in pine forests, in spruce forests, in Douglas fir forests, and in fir forests. There are three main groups of bark beetles that we're concerned about. The ones that uh, are going to cause the most mortality in the systems that we're going to experience in the west, and for that matter, the three, uh, three groups of bark beetles that are going to cause most of the mortality in needle leaf forests worldwide. So I can stand here in the middle of the desert to point out a conifer forest that's up above here, a pinyon pine forest, and I can say that this forest is at some point likely to be impacted by native bark beetles. They're that important. Virtually anywhere that you're going to look at a needle leaf forest in the west, it's potentially susceptible or shaped by bark beetles. They're that ubiquitous. They're, and they are uh, uh, it, it very important, uh, very important agents of mortality, as I say. So there are three, three main groups of bark beetles that we're concerned about. If we're specifically talking about needle leaf forests. The first, the worst of the bunch is the, are the dendroctinous bark beetles. Now that, um, that's a genus, and the word dendroctinous means tree killer. So it's probably, if, it's, if somebody went through the trouble of naming it tree killer, it's probably pretty bad. So those are the most, those, and, the, and they are, those are the most destructive of the western bark beetles. When you read about a big bark beetle outbreak in a newspaper article or something like that, it's probably a dendroctinus. Now, dendroctinus are uh, the mountain pine beetle, uh, Jeffrey pine beetle, um, other very destructive bark beetles such as uh, the southern pine beetle. These are bark beetles that can, once they reach uh, large population sizes, they can kill even healthy trees. Healthy trees can succumb to uh, what's called a mass attack. It's basically a population of bark beetles that's so large can overwhelm all of the defenses. Now, um, one of the problems in western forests is that because these are arid forests, when the environment changes because of a short-term drought, you know, a couple years of drought or even longer, that can increase the tree's susceptibility to bark beetle and predispose the systems to a large outbreak of, of something like dendroctinus. Now, the other two uh, genera that we're specifically concerned about are more sensitive to the environment. They need, they are more dependent on uh, an environmental cue to trigger an outbreak. So the second, second to dendroctinus, are the Scolitis bark beetles. Now in some parts of the world, Scolitis bark beetles can, can be uh, very destructive on their own. In the western United States, the main one that we're usually concerned about is called Scolitis ventralis. That is the bark beetle that affects true firs. So here in, in California, we would be especially concerned about Scolitis ventralis as an agent of mortality in white fir and in red fir. It is a damaging bark beetle. It can kill many trees on its own. Uh, it can reach uh, population sizes where uh, it can overwhelm the defenses of otherwise healthy trees. However, Scolitis is, is more dependent on some sort of environmental cue in order to uh, experience an outbreak. Now the last of, last of the group of those bark beetles are Ips bark beetles. Uh, 
most of the ips bark beetles in the west we tend to think about as being the weakest of the bark beetles the most dependent on some sort of environmental cue in order to experience an outbreak however you shouldn't i want to caution you against being too broad brush about any of these things because bio, uh, any, any of that kind of um you know, broad brush, Ips, the, Ips is the weakest bark beetle, something like that. Don't fall into that trap, into that sort of uh, dogmatic thinking. And I say that because Ips bark beetles can be very destructive. And sometimes they surprise us uh, in terms of the number of trees that they can kill and at the, at the scale at which they do so. In other parts of the world, and particularly in European spruce forests, if some Ips bark beetles are just simply very destructive on their own. So those are our th three groups, Dendroctinus, Scolitis, and Ips. They're all very damaging, potentially. They're all, they all can be problematic, uh, but here in Western forests, again, look at any Western forest, it's potentially at risk to bark beetle outbreak, but in all of them, these three groups of bark beetles are endemic. The Dendroctinus attacking the pines, Scolitis attacking firs, and Ips attacking primarily pines. Ooh. All right, mud volcano. Mammoth, of course, is a volcanic landscape. It's a really great area. But uh, climbing on a mud volcano is a little sketchy. I need to point out to you that it is January. It's late in the day. It's January 1st. Happy New Year. It's late in the day, and I am wearing a short sleeve t-shirt. It is a beautiful day. And there is not a lot of snow in this landscape, uh, which couldn't be more different than the way this place looked a year ago, um, or even two years ago for that matter. The low levels of snow right now, unfortunately, are more similar to the snow levels that we've had during the drought. And we'll really have to say, we'll really need to wait and see here. Um, I hope we get some big, powerful Pacific storms because that's really that's really the best way to solve a bark beetle outbreak problem. Uh, it needs to start raining again. <laughs> so uh, as they say in livestock management, you can't make it rain. And you can't make it rain in forestry either. And uh, unfortunately, that's what we really need to solve this bark, to, to solve the immediate bark beetle problem. In the long term, there are some things that forestry can do. We'll talk more about them. This area has been hard hit by bark beetle, by the bark beetle outbreak of the last few years. And I actually have some good news, which is that even though in this landscape that you're seeing behind me, there is a tremendous amount of mortality. The mortality appears to have stopped. Now that's the typical pattern for bark beetles. Bark beetles have explosive outbreaks uh, during very uh, set amounts of time usually associated with drought, sometimes with heat. And then once precipitation um, the levels get back to near normal, and uh, after mortality has been extensive, the bark beetle populations start to decrease. And we're seeing evidence of that here. These, um, as I say, there's a lot of dead trees behind me, but the mortality rate is, has clearly slowed to um, relative to the levels that it's been at for the last five years. Now, we don't, there's no guarantee about what will happen in the future. I would expect if you went out and you trapped bark beetles in these stands in this landscape, you'd find that the populations are still relatively high. Because remember that bark beetle mortality is a function not just of the bark beetle populations, but also uh, a function of the susceptibility of the plants. So once they begin to, once the plants, the trees begin to recover their defensive capacity, they are better able to fend off attack from bark beetles. But the populations may still be relatively high. Now, 
whether or not this is the end of the current Sierra Nevada bark beetle outbreak really depends on what happens with precipitation over the next, over the coming few years. Precipitation levels remain at what is normal um, or above average. If they are at average, uh, I think that we'll see the bark beetle outbreak subside and bark beetle population numbers will recover to their endemic levels, which are present but, but at relatively few. If we enter another drought phase, I would expect to see the bark, bark beetle mortality spike again um, when the, uh, when the populations which are here, which I expect are here, uh, begin to be able to attack more susceptible trees. Pinion deserves a lot of credit. It's not easy to grow right out of the side of a rock face. This is a typical wound reaction in, in pinyon pine. It's a very resinous tree. Uh, the most minor wound to the, to the plant will initiate um, this kind of defensive response. It's doing two things. It's potentially pushing an insect attacker out of the plant, and it's also covering up any exposed vascular tissue which protects the plant from uh, desiccation. And that's really important. It's important in any environment, but it's especially important here in this very arid environment. This tree has to be able to produce enough resin to push that material, um, that defensive compound, to the point of damage to the plant. Uh, and that's what's happened here. This tree has pushed a lot of resin in. It's uh, formed, a, formed a covering over the, over the wound and um, you can, if you could see up here, you would see some callousing of the tissue as well around the point of damage. The second thing that resins do is they actually have uh, compounds that are potentially toxic or are toxic to some bark beetles. Um, that's a, sort of a double bonus. Um, the resins do two things. Those toxic chemicals, um, terpenes, can actually... Um, damage the insects and kill them. And of course the resin itself immobilizes the insects and essentially imprisons them and uh, they die there because they can't move. The really amazing thing about resins is that when they're in the plant, they're relatively lower viscosity. They have to have that so that the plant needs that so it can move it around within the plant. But then once they're exposed to oxygen, their viscosity increases and um, all right, let's have a little up close and personal look at this resin here. Um, I've pulled this off the top of this pinion pine. Uh, it's very clearly bark beetle caused response of the individual of the uh, pinion pine. And I know that because the resin, well, first off, let me say, Pinion pine produces a lot of resin no matter what the physical um, damage is to the plant, whether it's from bark beetle or whether it's from uh, some other physical damage. But let's see here. You can diagnose uh, bark beetle attacks. Let's get that in focus there. 
you can diagnose bark beetle attack because the resin itself is uh, mixed with bits of bark and that's the brown uh, little dots that you're seeing there um, you can see it in this bit of resin also a little brown flex through here um, what's happened is the bark itself is a physical defense for the plant and the bark beetle has to get through that and it does so by grinding up the bark and passing it through its gut so these little pellet sized shape uh, size and shape of, uh, of bark are actually beetle poop um, we would call it frass uh, the, the insect has been able to overcome that physical defense and then the the other chemical and physical defense that the plant um, has uh, responded with is is this pitch and you can see that uh, even though it was fairly solid uh, as soon as I started touching it I warmed it up and now I made a huge mess of my hands and I'm not sure how I'm going to touch the camera um, you can see here I don't know how old this this pitch is some of it's a little bit harder um, pinion pine despite um, the amount of resin that it produces this stays in liquid form for quite a while which can be a risk to the to the plant because um, part of the physical defense of resin is to imprison the insect of course um, and if this is still liquid then there's a potential for the insect to move through it and escape our tour of the Providence range wouldn't be complete without stopping to look at at least one dead plant pathogens and insects are providing an essential service. They're killing plants. And that might sound like a funny thing to say, but mortality of individual plants provides opportunity for regeneration. It uh, reintroduces nutrients and carbon back into the soil. And it also provides habitat for a lot of different insects, birds, um, microbes, a bunch of things. So, Insects and pathogens, in fact, tree mortality is not always a problem. It can become a problem when we have high amounts of trees that die in a short period of time. There are many reasons for that. We lose our ecosystem services. We may we lose a valuable storage of carbon within these forests. And we have other problems that are associated with tree mortality, such as fuels buildup. Let's examine fire and bark beetle interactions with a visit to one more uh, forest. This is the ponderosa pine dominated forests around Prescott, Arizona, where bark beetles have historically had, and fire have had major impacts. Bark beetles have some unexpected relationships with fire. Uh, of course, fire affects the susceptibility of individual trees to bark beetle attack, but Bark beetles also can manipulate the dynamics of fire. Now, dead trees are a uh, oftentimes many dead trees, and which is which follows a large bark beetle outbreak, um, can be a very significant source of fuels. Fuels are one of the factors that influence fire behavior, and in particular, fire intensity. Now, bark beetles generate a tremendous amount of fuels, and at least they can in a very short period of time. Those, uh, those fuels can increase um, fire severity as well as fire intensity, but often they do not. Bark beetles, uh, that's why I say that bark beetles have a surprising relationship with fire. The, uh, the effect of bark beetle on, on fire dynamics is greatly dependent on the composition of, of dead fuels, the composition of the material that's killed by the um, insect attack. Now, fine fuels, um, dry leaves, dry needles, those are highly combustible. And when they are present in the canopy, that is right after a tree has been killed by bark beetle, they can pose a very serious uh, threat uh, in terms of the, of the uh, capacity for those, those conditions to increase fire intensity, which makes it more problematic to combat. However, once that material falls on the ground, uh, and particularly when the fine branches and fine leaves fall, needles fall on the ground, the uh, fire severity will actually 
decrease in stands with high bark beetle mortality. And the reason for that is because of the change in the composition of the fuels, in their structure, uh, in their location within the canopy. Once those materials reach the ground, they're more likely to have higher moisture content. They become impacted, and uh, which makes it more difficult for oxygen to get in and uh, really get that fire going. Um, and uh, because of that, after a certain amount of time, any increased risk due to bark beetle or increased risk of fire severity due to bark beetle subsides. So the very problematic conditions, let's be clear, sometimes bark beetle does cause problems in, in terms of a real threat of increasing fire severity. However, it's a fairly narrow window and it really happens when there are many dead trees and those trees have died in a very short period of time. So you can imagine what that stand looks like. Lots of dead trees where all the foliage is dead and it's still in the canopy. Those are the conditions that really demand a management response. I'm going to wrap up this case study by showing you two more photographs of signs of bark beetle attack. What you're seeing here is the frass that's generated by Scolitis ventralis. That's the bark beetle that has the greatest impact on true fir. It is a great risk for, has killed a lot of trees in the Sierra Nevada and is a great risk for even more mortality. But you can see here that the frass is kind of like a sawdust. Um, and you contrast that with dendroctinus, uh, with the signs of dendroctinus attack, which is this resinous um, exudation from ponderosa pine. And again, as I pointed out previously, one of the best ways to tell uh, attack by bark beetles is that uh, the bark material gets ground up and uh, mixed in with the resin that comes out of the tree. And so this is a pretty good example here where you can see that, that resin that includes ground up bark as well as some other resin without.